Good afternoon, Team Kulak community, and welcome back to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole on the Russia-Ukraine War. I remain, I remain your host here, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Kulak Center, and we're pleased to welcome back Dr. Yuval Weber, our Russia subject matter expert. And it has been uh, a couple weeks uh, since we last did this, and we've been talking over the last week or so about some things to queue up the next episode. And uh, our list just got a lot longer in about the, the last, uh, I'd say, 48 to 72 hours um, to the point where uh, the stuff we were going to hit on two weeks ago now feels like ancient history. But anyway, we will try and do a, a, a good roll up of the things that have happened since our last episode when uh, I think we last talked about. Uh, well, I'm sorry, we, we did Bakhmut and then we had the special episode between you and Dan talking about the meeting between. Xi Jinping and uh, Vladimir Putin, and they had their their big friendship summit about how things are happening that have not happened in a hundred years, uh, which makes everybody feel great. Um, but uh, so, but for, before I forget, you've all first of all, I want to wish you a happy Moscow Day. Uh, it was a year to, a year ago today that the uh, the Russian flagship of the Black Sea, Moskva, was promoted to becoming uh, head of the submarine fleet there in the Black Sea, in the Russian presence. So, I just want to make sure we mark the occasion. I think it would have been the first time in probably centuries that, you know, the Russians had lost uh, a flagship. And uh, since then, they they moved away from the west coast of uh, the Black Sea. And that led to the ending of the naval blockade around um, Odessa. So that uh, that operation really did make a a shift uh, in, in, in the conflict itself. Yeah, I mean, we've. Uh... Things have been quiet, at least in terms of the naval operations. I think there there have been intermittent periodic reports of, uh, you know, small sporadic attacks on some of the, uh, you know, Russian military facilities on Crimea, you know, but otherwise Russian Navy hasn't had much of a much to do out of there since then, except sort of stay outside the weapon engagement zone of Ukrainian forces. So happy Moscow Day. We'll uh, we'll see if it has any sister ships joining in here in another year, depending on how things go and hopefully it's not another year hopefully we're not we're not talking about this another year on so we're going to get into the ancient history now of a couple of weeks ago two, two very different things um one was very strong impact to one person and the other was uh kind of a a, a huge a confirmation of a significant shift in the security arrangements of the region so we had the uh we had the blogger assassination of a uh, russian military blogger in a very public place and I was going to say it's a very strange story, but then things that have happened the last couple of weeks, like I'm, I'm not going to put I've, I can't categorize strange anymore because we're just living in a in a in a world of of things that are like if you wrote, if you put this in a screenplay for Hollywood, they'd be like, no, nah, this is too this is too far fetched. Um, but there was a Russian military blogger who very, you know, uh, he was given a talk, if I recall, um, in a restaurant, very public place. And in a very public place, he was supposedly handed a allegedly a statue of some kind that had some sort of explosive device. And um, there was some some pretty remarkable video that came out of that, of this device blew out the restaurant and assassinated the blogger. As with some of these other previous things, there was that car bombing last year of a, you know, the, the daughter of Putin's brain. Um, again, and these things, they've happened again sporadically, but uh, sort of no no seeming particular pattern, um, except for the fact that there are there are supporters of the war in Ukraine who keep blowing up. So uh, what do we know? What do we know? Um, or, or what can we extrapolate from that incident of the, uh, in the, the midst of time of two weeks ago? So, yes, uh, we're going to talk uh, both, I guess, at the top of the top of the episode and at the bottom of the episode about the corrosive nature of, uh, of egos. And one little, one little detail uh, from your description that, it, that needs to be uh, mentioned is that this was actually caught all on video. Um, up to and including the explosion itself. The guy, uh, so sort of this pen name is uh, Vladlen Tatarsky, and Vladlen um, is sort of a, a very sort of like 1920s era name because Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, Vlad Len, so basically the first uh, two syllables of uh, Lenin's name. And Tatarsky is, you know, an adjective of, you know, someone who's Tatar. So referring to, you know, Russia's sort of Turkic Mongol uh, past. So this is a name that is referring to, you know, wilder, more aggressive, more, um, you know, world changing parts of Russia's history. So like the name itself um, was meant to be like, 
uh, you know, cool guy Johnson uh, sort of thing. Um, yeah, so in the video itself, there's a young lady just sort of walks up, hands the guy a box and tries to walk away a bit. And he sort of like, you no, know, says like, you know, young lady, like, don't need to walk away too quickly. Um, let me see what you've brought. And he takes out a statuette, like sort of like a bust and a bust is of him. <laughs> and so, you know, it's sort of like um, painted sort of golden, like obviously it's not like solid gold cause it's not like super heavy, but he's like, oh wow, you've given me a bust of me. This is like such a fun, cool thing uh, to get. He invites her to sit down. Uh, she sort of sits like off to the side. He continues to, legit he clearly starts to launch into just another monologue about himself. And then this, you hear the boom and you see the screen go black. And in the videos that I saw there after, um, she's obviously like injured, like not injured enough where she's like, you know, totally out of it, but like dripping blood. There's a lot of other people like around in various states of like, we just got blown up. And what's wild is that you hear the bystanders who are obviously just saying like, this is unbelievable. I cannot imagine something like this happens in St. Petersburg. And so even people going to an event featuring like a guy talking about his experiences, fighting the war, writing about the war, having this sort of thing, the people who were interested in basically like this firsthand account of what life in, you know, wartime Ukraine is like, were absolutely shocked that in essence, any aspect of it could actually come back to them in their, you know, fairly large, um, fairly metropolitan city. So that was basically the, the situation itself. Uh, she was arrested. Um, turns out she is a member of the, um, the small, uh, small, uh, under, under, under deep threat, um, you know, liberal community of St. Petersburg and had been well known in town for being a feminist and anti-war activist. Uh, she had previously been detained for anti-war activities. Her husband had said that, um, she was against the war, but would never, um, never do anything violent that she was against violence. That's why she was anti-war. And he implied that she was basically manipulated into this. I would never knowingly handle explosives and be involved in this sort of thing. The authorities have said that this person is obviously part of the, you know, Alexei Navalny movement, which is clearly working on the orders of uh, Kiev. And so basically liberals, you know, the main foreign enemy, those are being brought together. This was again, um, when Daria Dugina, as you mentioned a moment ago, when she was assassinated uh, by car bomb, um, the same sort of thing. Clearly, the the agents of Navalny taking orders from Kiev. That's what resulted in all of this. As yet, because there's no public, you know, release of any information, um, nor would any of the information sort of would have to be treated with a great degree of skepticism. It's unknown whether this is actually Ukraine, whether this is like you know li the liberals of Saint Petersburg taking. Uh, matters into their own hands, or whether this was something within basically either the right wing of Russian politics or the security services. The guy Tatarsky has been deeply associated with uh, the Wagner private military group. And so it could also have been basically someone from the defense ministry or other part of the Russian government wanting to sort of send a message to Yevgeny Prigozhin that even if he's basically simmered his feud with Sergei Shoigu and the uh and the Russian basically like military the Russian military or its agents will still go after um you know Russian citizens working for Wagner inside Russia so again we don't know uh, as yet like what the definitive truth is we may never know uh but we do know uh who's going to be blamed and that's Alexei Navalny and basically the Ukrainians yeah I, I mean there's no I'm sure they have no lack of scapegoats and uh, you know, I doubt few in Russia are going to question sort of the cognitive dissonance because of what I understand, you know, Navani is a, you know, he's a dissident. Obviously, he's been put in jail under pretty horrible conditions for daring to say that Russia should have somebody besides Putin in charge. Um, but he's not necessarily a, a sort of, you know, friend or fellow traveler of Ukraine, um, I think. But, you know, again, why not put all the enemies into one basket? So uh, so the, the Wagner piece, I think, will come. We'll circle back to that when we go into 
uh, sort of the situation around Bakhmut. But uh, again, back in the uh, the ancient mist of time of two weeks ago, so another another very major story, which was you know a a significant shift in the security framework of uh, of Europe, especially Eastern Europe and the NATO alliance, was Finland um, was went through its way through the approval process and was finally formally admitted as the 31st member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. You know, we had talked about this in basically since Sweden and Finland both applied to uh, for NATO membership shortly after the initial invasion. Obviously, you know, Swedish Sweden's application has been held up for other reasons, but it was noted that Finland going in, among other things, uh, significantly extends uh, the border between NATO allied countries and Russian allied countries. And uh, so a- among our various discussions of, you know, does does Putin, does Putin really kind of give a crap about whether NATO expands or not? He talks a lot about it, but he, you know, one of these self owns, he's now essentially doubled the size of the border that he would have to defend against NATO um, slash exposed his own border to potential, you know, access by NATO if that were ever uh, a conflict ever to break out between them, you know, and then he would say, no, I don't care that NATO and NATO and or Finland, so he didn't apply to NATO, no big deal to me. But anyway, wh- however, you know, whichever sort of side of the bed he wakes up in the morning, it is a significant change because it's the first new NATO member, I want to say, since probably um, early to mid 90s, you know, fall, um, fall of Berlin, Berlin Wall. And uh, Iron Curtain comes up and Eastern European countries all, you know, wanted to get into the NATO organization uh, when they could. What are some of the highlights of that um, to hit here? So I think we, you know, the first thing that we know, just like, so it was just quickly looking up the numbers here. So prior to Finland joining, Russia had um, uh, 755 miles or 1,215 kilometers. So 755 miles of land border with five NATO members. Um, and that, uh, predominantly the, the Baltic states, um, and Poland, and I guess, uh, it touches there. uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, if I look at a better map, um, but with, uh, Finland joining an additional 830 miles of border or more than 1300 kilometers of border, um, between NATO and Russia have now been added. The key thing, you know, for many years, there's been a long discussion about what needed Russia to feel so insecure. And the reason that uh, Putin and you know supporters of Putin have often said it's NATO expansion. NATO expansion is the thing which has made Russia insecure. Putin has said at numerous times over the past year or so that Finland and Sweden joining NATO are obviously not good. Like, you know, he doesn't like approve or like it, but because those countries are not Ukraine, that even though this will cause Russia to increase its, you know, capabilities and, you know, its posture along the border with Finland, that this doesn't represent the same threat. And the relatively muted response of Russia to having Finland, which has an entire army that's only built for the one purpose of defending against invasion from Russia, should, I think, for once and all, sort of put that question to bed about what motivated Russia or Putin's insecurity. Putin was insecure, not because NATO was a threat, but that because there were countries that wished to join NATO specifically to gain the collective defense and the collective capabilities of NATO. And that Ukraine was the most offensive out of all of these because the demonstration effect of Ukraine basically opting to give up, you know, a fully independent foreign policy sovereignty, autonomy, all of these things in order to defend itself against Russia. And when Russians talk about the need uh, for, you know, great powers and all countries that respect themselves to, you know, defend their sovereignty, defend their autonomy, defend their foreign policy, to observe a country such as Ukraine, which they consider to be a, a junior version of themselves, willingly giving up all those things. We should be able to see for basically now and, you know, into the mists of the future, why in essence, Putin did what he did. It's because a happy, healthy European Ukraine essentially is a humiliation. And so in that regard, the, basically the opposition of Finland to Russia is not that much more than it was before. Finland had an army meant to withstand Russian invasion before they join NATO and after they joined NATO. The only difference between them joining NATO or not is basically 
whatever was the last 1% of interoperability. And obviously like the greater percentage of what, uh, you know, NATO's nuclear capabilities and just sort of larger uh, pooled um, capabilities are able to offer. And that is just, you know, a structural change owing to uh, one person's insecurity. And the Russia after Putin is going to have to deal with essentially being uh, far more than before, uh, basically defended along, alongside effectively the entirety of its borders, its Western borders uh, by NATO, just because Putin was upset. Yeah. And uh, I think I think it's also worth reemphasizing the point of, you know, these th this shift in Putin's reaction to it, you know, before the shift where he decided to apply, you know, the lion's share of Russia's military and security resources compared to what he said was the biggest threat. You know, it's it, to me, it's just, you know, the the idea that that NATO expansion somehow, you know, provoked him or caused this whole thing. I'm like, he he put his cards on the table for what he saw was the biggest threat, like the thing that was most important to him. And it wasn't NATO. He, he seems largely indifferent. Um, it was Ukraine. So, yeah, he he may not have, not have thought that through all the way, but um, in terms of, you know, determining who what what motivated him in these things, I think it's it's something that has to be kept in mind as we especially if we start looking at whatever the, the security landscape looks like after the war is over. The, the idea that NATO was was a was a problem to him seems doesn't really quite hold up. Extending the border by two times the length. It's again, interesting cell phone. But if you don't if you honestly don't care about that, it doesn't it doesn't bother you. So the, the dumbest analogy that I've thought about this, and this is like you will get dumber just listening to this is sometimes you hear of, you know, like students spending uh, scholarship money on really fashionable clothes or shoes, and they then can't live, you know, either get kicked out of their apartment or fail out of school. That has the same sort of like energy of you wanted something immediately. You had all the belief in the world that everything would work out fine thereafter, failed to consider the consequences, and the consequences came immediately. Oh, we're we're about to get all dumb up in here when we get down to our last talking uh, topic yeah. of discussion as headlines are getting updated sort of here on the hour. Don't want to do a spoiler alert too much. What say? So, and, you know, as, so as we talk about, you know, what this war has caused in terms of, you know, Putin's insecurity and what this has meant to the structural conditions facing Russia, uh, you know, defining Russia's security, um, you know, in Russia's uh, Western flank, obviously Finland joining NATO. And we can imagine that if and when basically like Erdogan leaves power in Turkey and Orban leaves power in um, in uh, Hungary, that Sweden will basically be joining uh, NATO shortly thereafter, which obviously then creates almost a totally enclosed NATO uh, lake in the Baltic Sea, uh, which essentially helps control access to the North Atlantic from the Arctic, which will all be basically all NATO at that point. Um, another area that this war has revealed structural changes to Russia's ability to provide security or project power in its own region is, is in its south, um, its southern flank in the Caucasus. And one thing to note is that in recent weeks, the Azerbaijanis uh, in the Caucasus uh, have not only deployed troops, artillery, um, and obviously drone units to the border with, you know, Armenia proper, um, they have attacked uh, border installations um, in Armenia proper. So not even the Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, you know, uh, to claim or reclaim their land, but they are attacking Armenia. And so what we have here is Russia being so distracted by, you know, the, the failing war in Ukraine that they've been unable to provide security to one of their security alliance members. In recent years, uh, uh, Putin uh, explicitly noted that uh, CSTO protection goes to Armenia, but not to Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno-Karabakh is the land that Armenia conquered from Azerbaijan, basically over the course of the late 80s, early 1990s, and which they've been steadily losing over the past number of years because Armenia is a poor country, and Azerbaijan is a wealthy oil and gas exporter and has put a lot of those resources into buying military equipment from primarily uh, Turkey and Israel, uh, but also basically working directly with the, the Turks in order to retake their land. So they've been retaking portions of Nagorno-Karabakh 
uh, basically at will over the last couple of years. And they've always basically adhered to a soft, uh, basically the soft limit of not attacking Armenia directly. Given Russia's distraction, given the, the lack of U.S. attention uh, to the region writ large, Armenia, so Azerbaijan is now attacking Armenia directly. And this is, in fact, uh, showing what Russia can't do, even though Putin, not more than two years ago, said that he would defend Armenia, but not Nagorno-Karabakh. So just another example of what happens if your commitments and your capabilities uh, do not match. Yeah, and it's the that inability and sort of the going back to the spending the scholarship money right on like, you know, closing a good restaurant today rather than than your scholarship long term investment. I think we're going to we're going to keep tying building this framework or, or sort of weaving this this web. I don't know what analogy you want to use, but to just how much Putin has mortgaged everything and any any possibility of a, you know, sort of a, a, a muscular impactful future for Russia on any stage to this one conflict, because as, as uh, you mentioned, you know, he can't even get into his next door neighbor, right. And under security degree that he was, that he thinks is a priority. Uh, we had Dr. Tarzi talking to uh, some of the folks at the combined joint task force horn of Africa today, where our director uh, general Jackson is, you know, she's currently stationed giving a PME on uh, you, you know, on security concerns for sort of like middle East, Yemen, Iran, how that's all shaping out and what that does to um you know, second order effects down there into the Horn of Africa. But in, you know, he mentioned how, how Russia has, is mortgaging itself to China for this one thing. Meanwhile, China is starting to get a much uh, more significant presence down in that, you know, region in the Horn of Africa as they are, you know, trying to sort of extend globally. Um, but the, the, his point was, you know, Russia's contracting significantly um, for this one thing. And then this one thing that it's not even doing very well and uh, others are definitely taking advantage, whether that's China in the far abroad or um, the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict and next door neighbors. It's just uh, I, maybe someday somebody will put, put together sort of like a stack, a list of all the things that, uh, that Russia can't do now. And it's just going to be stunning. You're going to have Ukraine in one column and all these other things in one column. And, you know, unless there's a significant you know shift in misfortune for the ukrainian side that ukraine in the one column is probably going to have an asterisk beside it the short sidedness it's remarkable to think about but again we're going to get to some short-sighted stuff here at the end of the episode too so um, yeah putin's not alone in cutting off his nose despite his face so i think that uh that brings us up to the brings us up to the last sort of 72 hours tracking yeah. our, our discussions here so kind of the the next couple of things we wanted to hit here are uh you know we had done a we done a focus on the fighting around bach a couple of episodes ago and in in watching the fighting um it seems that russian forces continue to make extremely incremental gains but it's bachmet holds is sort of the the phrase that's out there um and talking about uh the defense of the city and incremental gains on the russian side they have not taken the city and there, I think there have been some shifts in terms of the forces that are there, you know, switching Wagner, Wagner group units with, uh, with VDV and conventional Russian forces, you know, but that's still happening. But then, um, in the, I think it was last 72 hours and you were sort of tying this to Bakhmut was, uh, there was released a couple of pretty horrifying videos. I, I've not watched them or attempted to seek them out, but videos showing, um, the execution of a live Ukrainian prisoner of war. And then it, it was unclear whether um, the in the other video the the prisoners were were executed and then mutilated, or if they just found their bodies and mutilated. But the point was there were a couple of other Ukrainian prisoners who were filmed, um, and their bodies had been, I think, both decapitated and had their hands cut off as well. And this you were you were thinking this might sort of tie into continued Russian attempts to to take Bakhmut and or perhaps influence upcoming Ukrainian counteroffensive. So, um, so let's shift to that. So certainly, and you know, the, I have not seen the videos, but everyone who has says it's, it's medieval. And, you know, the comment I made to you the other day was, this is basically just like ISIS of the North, or I said, this is like Slavic ISIS. And apparently, you know, yeah, it's ISIS with snow, right? That's, ISIS that's what snow. I, people have been sort of tossing around. So that's on one side. So like what the larger context of Bakhmut is that 
you know, as we've talked about, you know, seemingly for like months at this point, is that Bakhmut as a city has relatively little, if any, like actual military value, but it's become a symbol. Earlier in, unfortunately, much earlier in our series, uh, because we've been doing this for more than a year at this point, you know, I talked about the mayor of uh, Mykolaiv, which is one of the cities on the Dnieper River. And he was saying at the beginning of the conflict, you know, I'm going to make my city Stalingrad. And obviously, you know, people at the time were like, what, what, what does Stalingrad mean? Stalingrad means your city will be destroyed. Because essentially the, the Western conception of Stalingrad is that is the place where lots of people died. Like the, the Germans, the Soviets, everyone. But in terms of Soviet political culture and Soviet, in essence, um, you know, political history, Stalingrad was the place where the, the Red Army had been losing basically everywhere. The Germans had been advancing everywhere. But at Stalingrad, the Red Army stood their ground, dug their heels in, took a massive beating. The city was destroyed beyond belief, but they held. And that's the point where the tide was turned. And so the idea of Stalingrad within Soviet and then Russian political history is this is the place where you do not give any more um, than you have before. And that you basically, you hold the line and then you move forward. And it seems that this has become, in essence, what Bakhmut has started to represent. The, the Wagner, basically what, at this point, six months ago or so, um, wanted to use this basically like, I think arbitrarily chosen town to demonstrate that they could do what the Russian military, like the official military could not. And so they started to go after it. They started to use convicts um, and other mobilized troops in order to basically just use human wave attacks to overwhelm basically the defenders of this town. The defenders did not give in. And there, and from that point, the value of Bakhmut became more deeply political. And it became at this point, what we can see, given that Zelensky has now visited twice, this has formed a clearly symbolic um, value for both sides. For the Russians, that they can take any city that they properly devote resources to. For the Ukrainian, that they can defend any city. And that is, you know, essentially what we've had in terms of, you know, the symbol of Bakhmut. So why now? Are, are we starting to see these like snuff films and all these like evidence of not just like war crimes, but just crimes against humanity? The Russian offensive over the last couple of months has basically been like many things that they've done throughout this war, um, too widely dispersed and too varied in the goals. And what we haven't seen is the Russians being able to take to move uh, their their armies forward and to hold territory. And so at this point, the Russians are probably very concerned that if and when the Ukrainian counteroffensive comes, there's going to be a lot of Ukrainian movement over a lot of poorly motivated, poorly trained, and poorly equipped troops. One of the threads that I saw on, on Twitter over the last couple of days is by a political scientist named uh, Branislav Slanchev, uh, a Bulgarian guy, who I think is at University of California, uh, San Diego. And he made the larger point that perhaps what this video is meant to uh, to show, and the video itself, again, I haven't seen it, but apparently the grass is green, which suggests that this was taken maybe sometime uh, last summer, is that this is meant to make Ukrainians and the outside world extremely angry and to try to provoke them, if possible, into doing similar things themselves. That probably is not going to happen because the Ukrainians know they'll be head, held to account in the way that Russians simply aren't. But what it can do is by popularizing and, you know, publicizing a video like this on the Russian side, as well as on the Ukrainian side, it is to make the Ukrainians so mad that they will fight harder. And this is meant to essentially be as a psyops against their own troops, a mechanism to get the Wagner and other Russian army soldiers to fight even harder, to not be taken prisoner, and to not essentially give up at any point because of the threat or fear of maybe being beheaded, 
but more likely being treated very poorly as a POW, and at minimum, to have some fate that's really bad. So what Slantiv argues is that, in fact, getting the entire world angry at Russian soldiers is meant to actually buck up the morale of the Russian soldiers to make them fight so afraid as to make them fight as hard as possible in anticipation of the forthcoming counteroffensive. It's an interesting strategy, and it's it's ghoulish and horror. I mean, and horrifying at the same time. Um, in some ways, the medium of the video is relatively new, but I was also reading um, a piece uh, a couple of days ago talking about you know what the soldiers were doing in that video, and in terms of how how the you know Russian going back to the Soviet, going back to the czarist military has behaved, the the, the brutality is not new. Uh, there's just there's something in the water that seems to encourage or motivate or, or incentivize, or, or as you said, like that simply not care. There's no consequences. So why, you know, why not act like a, like a barbarian, right? Cause you know, nothing, nothing bad's going to happen to you. You know, certainly not from your own commanders. But again, this, this kind of goes back into like the, the, the self own point of, you know, it's certainly going to make the Ukrainian soldiers fight harder. And you're, you're essentially giving, you know, through the information ops, you're giving, Ukraine more, um, you know, more digital ammunition to continue to keep open the pipeline of support. And that pipeline of support is, you know, one, what keeps them in the battlefield, but two, also what uh, what has, you know, we've gone up sort of the, the ladder of weapon systems going there. You're by keeping that pipeline open and maybe you're opening up the possibility for even like, I'm, I'm not saying jets are on the table now because of this one video, but you simply make it easier for the West to say, yeah, we'll give them this. Mm -hmm. give them x y and z which makes it harder for you on the russian side to achieve your military objectives on the battlefield where when you could have been going up against old like t60 series tanks now you're going up against abrams right because you shared snuff films like was the backwards motivation effort of your soldiers worth that and it's just it's it's this calculus that we've seen this before and i you know i i don't understand it you know um if I were looking to motivate soldiers, hey, maybe improve their living conditions, treat them like human beings, you know, provide them with good tactical, tactically smart leadership and logistic supplies and all that stuff. But, you know, I'm I'm not cut from the Russian cloth. But again, like you are United States Marine Corps major. You have been brought up in one type of system. You are talking about a system in which all those things that you just mentioned are very expensive, difficult to supply and run counter to hundreds of years of tradition. So in essence, you can motivate people by saying, uh, if you go and so again, and so this is actually like a tie-in to like the guy that we described, that we were talking about at the beginning of the hour, um, Vladlan Tatarsky. So when he was at a Kremlin event, sort of celebrating the, the seizure, the recognition of LNR DNR, he, he, he filmed basically like an old little selfie video that, you know, he put online and became, you know, this viral sensation amongst like, you know, the Russian mill blogger community is he said, we're going to kill everyone. We're going to um, take everything that we want. We're going to be successful. We'll rob anyone that we need to, or something to that effect. I can get the exact quote. And that's essentially the motivation there. The Russians at this point are are down to, you know, these like very old fashioned methods of motivation and morale building which is if you're successful, you can act like a brigand and take whatever it is that is or is not nailed down. The alternative is if you don't do this, uh, either the opposition, the adversary is going to do horrible things to you. And if you don't even try, we'll do horrible things to you. So in this regard, we see, you know, these uh, blocking detachments that, you know, had last been seen in like World War II. And like, those are the choices and like the sources of motivation of basically your average like Wagner mercenary or like mobilized soldier. You can basically do this for personal gain. You can do this because if you don't do bad things to the Ukrainians, they'll do bad things to you. Or if you don't even try, we're gonna do bad things to you uh, to set an example for the rest. So in that regard, what are the safety and survival strategies for like the Russian soldiers at the front? it's being reduced to effectively zero. And like, that's essentially like the world in which those guys live in. 
it's an it's an alien world um you know but again as the piece that i mentioned it may be alien to us but it there's a long historical tradition at least in the last century or so for the russian military you know i don't know maybe maybe we should have paid closer attention you know it's it's a, a weird mixed tradition between the brutality and indifference and lackadaisical battlefield performance and I, I probably, um, I would think, unfortunately, these these may not be the last videos we see, especially if, you know, as expected at some point in the coming weeks or months, Ukraine launches its counteroffensive. You know, what else? What else are the sort of the beatings continue to the morale improves? What other what other brutal efforts would the Russian commanders feel necessary to motivate the troops to stand their ground? Yeah, unfortunately, it's probably not the last word in that. So I think that now catches us up to today and as you were talking there i was scrolling uh scrolling through updates because for our, our last topic new updates are coming fast and furious and this uh we're gonna tie, <laughs> tie this back to it's good it's, it's gonna get all stupid up in here um some of the the things and words that are going to come out of our mouths here i think we could not have possibly imagined we would be using these words in the context of conventional 21st century high intensity warfare or larger military intelligence operations but but here we are where would you like to start with this we'll get into the details including trying to explain uh discord for our, our non-gaming uh listeners and viewers but let's start uh perhaps with the uh the email that you received the other day oh okay yes so uh i had uh, and i i believe everybody um who wears a uniform or works under the you know the office of uh, or under the department of defense uh we all got a personal email from um kathleen hicks who's deputy secretary of defense and reminding us about the need uh, the subject was department of defense guidance on safeguarding responsibilities regarding classified information and uh a, a friendly reminder that in the case of recent reporting on unauthorized disclosure of what appear to be classified Department of Defense and Intelligence Community documents to, uh, and I, I'm not trying to downplay this because this is stuff that we are trained on. We get annual training on it and 99.9999999999% of us take this incredibly seriously because we were fully aware of uh, the damage that can be done by not properly controlling classified information. And so it's reminders that, you know, one, um, you're not supposed to do that. Two, if you just because somebody else did it doesn't mean that the information itself is not classified and that you don't need to safeguard it. And in bolded here, there, this is going to get into our story here. So um, bolded in this message was do not access or download documents with classified markings from unclassified websites, either at home or at work. So um, I assume most of our, our listeners sort of know what we're talking about here, but it's uh, it's that unclassified website and downloading classified documents from them that has be has exploded as a uh, potentially one of the worst um, intelligence leaks of recent uh, history. If I may get personal for a second here, I assume Kath Hicks does not often email you. No, I believe this is the first time that I have heard from uh, from not just from her, but from any deputy secretary of defense. Okay. Um, yeah. It's uh, not a, not a daily occurrence. So for the, the two to three listeners who are unaware of what we're talking about, it is unclear as of yet the true scale of the recent leak of classified information, um, over the past couple, uh, days and weeks, um, that'll emerge from, as we promised the dumbest possible outcome or the dumbest possible source but that this has been a leak that has gone into uh, a tactical level understanding of the situation in uh, Ukraine, discussions of basically Ukraine's munitions uh, stockpiles and basically the munition strategy going forward. Um, apparently there's been evidence of deep uh, penetration by the US uh, into every manner of the, the Russian uh, government and military and, of, and um, American assessments of various other international issues, uh, Israel, South Korea, um, and, and, and several others. So to this point, we don't yet know the true scale uh, of, of what has been leaked. Um, and I was reading the reporting today in the Washington Post, and the Washington Post uh, reporters, uh, Machine Harris and 
the other person whose name escapes me at the moment, um, they wrote in, in their story that they were able to contact one of the people, and we'll explain in a second what this is, in a, in a Discord group um, that was able to show them 300 different images of pieces of intelligence that had been printed out. And apparently each of these pieces of paper, you know, from whatever printer, had been uh, you know, folded twice over to indicate they'd been taken out in pockets um, and you know, taken home to be photographed and then posted online. But that this really um, reveals not just the amount of intelligence and intelligence assessments, but apparently there was no uh, care taken to, um, to even hide stuff that revealed sources and methods of how the intelligence was um, obtained in the first place. So in recent years, obviously, and, you know, in, you know, can always jump in with, you know, your experiences at, at that time, but there have been a tremendous number of uh, security leaks. Uh, Edward Snowden uh, was a big one because he revealed um, U.S. Uh, surveillance programs uh, worldwide, uh, including in Europe. There had been um, Bradley, uh, which is Chelsea Manning, um, who disclosed uh, quite a bit about U.S. activities in Iraq and Afghanistan, but that this one seems to be, in fact, quite broad because it really uh, included both sources and methods as well as, um, you know, tactical level intelligence, as well as basically U.S. and, you know, partner and ally strategy about issues going forward. So to that level, we have a gigantic leak big enough that Kathleen Hicks emailed like ostensibly 4 million people. It's only probably going to get worse um, as as the individual um, is identified and arrested. And as it happens, I, again, I was scrolling through. We were talking before we started recording that um, it seemed like the uh, investigators had narrowed it down to first. They narrowed it down to someone on a military base. They narrowed it further to a potentially someone working with uh, Air National Guard and then narrowed it down to Massachusetts Air National Guard. And as I'm reading now, there's actually a name uh, that's uh, going out there. So a great testament to investigatory skills, you know, for, you know, from flash to bang, being able to find the person who did it within uh, a handful of days. But but going back to the how long this information was out there, apparently this information was on, you know, shared on a, uh, as you mentioned, a discord server for at least a couple months um, before the spillage was identified. And, and so this Reading. is a great moment. Do you want to take this or shall I? What is Discord? What is a server? What is a channel? Like, I feel like this is something I would hear in like a bad dream and wake up and tell my wife and she'd be like, wow, yeah, that was too, that was too crazy for the real world. The documents were apparently shared on a, on a Discord server for a closed group of people playing the game Minecraft. And it's just this, it seems so silly to be talking about this in the context of, you know, the continued carnage going on over in Ukraine. But this is an aspect, I think, of 21st century, not, not just military operations, but intelligence, counterintelligence and the the information domain as a active, contested battlefield where potential advantages can be gained or squandered, depending on who's operating it. And th this may just be the, the the most strongest manifestation of that. But as we were talking about before, again, I, you know, it, it feels like crazy talk to say, yeah, it was spilled on a Minecraft on a, on a Discord server for people playing Minecraft. But I but I'd said folks like uh, like Matthew Ford and Andrew Hoskins, who had talked to us a few, you know, earlier this year, actually a couple of times now in the war in Ukraine about, you know, their radical war construct, which is the the mediated battlefield. And like media is the part that is underlined all the different types of different digital media access points, devices, platforms, networks that are now part of 21st century conflict and competition. And uh, th there are some who understand that, um, you know, the impacts of that better than others. <laughs> but okay, but to your question. So I would, I would guess most of our listeners know what Minecraft is. Like it's a retro game where like you mine stuff, like you build stuff, you mine stuff, you can make little tools, you fight creepers and, and, mobs and zombies and endermen and the ender dragon and uh again i feel crazy talking about all this right now but yeah so it's minecraft it's a game it's a computer game now discord um is a it's not a it's not a game but it's a a uh for game it's an application that gamers use very extensively and it's it's got both a 
a voice, um, a voice capability and a texting capability. And you can, in, in general strokes, like if you're, if you're playing a, a video game that doesn't have sort of a built-in like voice or texting capability, such as Minecraft, for example, you can use Discord to like coordinate and play with your friends, right? So you can still play in the same multiplayer game and like talk and share information, even though the game itself doesn't have it. So Discord lets you do that. And uh, apparently it's also it's also a way that you can share pictures and files and stuff like that. Um, but it's it's essentially a a it's a it's got both a social aspect and sort of like a command and control aspect for gamers for how they use it. And you can set up different channels like if you're if you uh, if you want to join different, you know, sort of like servers for different games. Like if you're a Minecrafter, you join one. If you're into Fortnite, you play another. Um, if you're into digitization of analog tabletop games uh you go into another one and it's just it's a community it's a software application for a community of gamers it seems the context of this was the leaker um who apparently had access to this this global incredibly detailed level of intelligence had joined a joined in a, a minecraft gaming server with about two dozen other folks and uh i'm reading one of the the stories here united by their mutual love of guns, gear, and God. They just formed this, it's a little digital club on the Discord server where they could they could talk and play Minecraft, but also, you know, talk and just share and sort of socialize digitally. And uh, it notes that it was it was formed in 2020 as a, and this ties into some of the, the aspects of, the, you know, the impacts of the pandemic and some second, third order effects is, you know, I, I think we all know come 2020, a lot of us stayed home, right? Like we lost those social connections. So things like, like like the gaming community the online gaming community that's where you went to socialize right to to find those other like to have some human interaction in at least some form um when you couldn't do physical human interaction anymore so like i don't i don't want to over overstate or over speculate whether you know this person was suffering from extreme isolation or if the timing was just coincidence and he would have been in that minecraft gaming server anyway but the point is um it was a server used to coordinate games and it become it became a place where i i guess to increase his standing with uh fellow minecrafters started sharing this stuff to show what a big you know big man he was in terms of in terms of access in terms of how highly placed you know how important his job was kind of thing and uh he's, he apparently he went by the nickname og you know which is original gangster right that He's proven he's an original gangster because he's dumping top secret information onto the internet. Not not just on not even on the internet to like twenty something other people to just impress them in his in his little gaming circle. Um, and so this this one this goes back to the the impact which we're probably going to be absorbing for a long time for the lowest stakes possible of impressing a handful of people who you ne you never even physically met. Right, you're you're hanging out and talking minecraft smack in the same server um and uh you know but this looking back at some of those other things like you know whether it's snowden or manning or reality winner uh the, the the motivation for like why why do people do this we say why does this keep happening but it's really it, it goes back to some very old ancient arguably concepts for why do people betray their interests, betray the organization or the military or their country? And it goes into this acronym you were talking about before. So maybe let's all, I'm going to shut up and hand it over to you. We can talk about what possible motivations um, are at play here. Yeah. So to, to bring it all together, what we have here is that Discord is a social gaming app, is a social app. Um, and it has basically like almost huge number of big channels and channels are basically like the the first layer of differentiation and channels can be devoted to anything and within those channels you can have smaller groups and often these groups are by invitation only so during the pandemic uh, apparently a group of people who were you know interested in this one game called minecraft were interested in a different um youtuber who plays like video games online and for again those of you who are maybe like above the age of 30, um, or maybe like, I don't know, I'm 41, but I have never been a real video game guy. Uh, what's really big on the internet is watching people play video games, but also there's video on them and they're also recording their audio. So basically it's a fully immersive experience. And lots of these people 
have gained um, you know, renown or notori notoriety online by essentially being good or bad at video games, but also having entertaining personalities. Apparently we had a subgroup of a subgroup of a subgroup that formed this one sort of like group in question. And that this was a group that was uh, also had a lot of sort of um, edgelord uh, type sensibilities. And what is an edgelord you might ask? Elon Musk is an edgelord. And this is a person who basically makes them seals, makes themselves feel better by being provocative online, trolling other people, um, <clears throat> using racist or anti-Semitic or um, you know, misogynistic language, whether they believe it or not, but just to get a thrill and just to irritate others. So that's part of this community. So ostensibly we had an individual who was telling people within his group, and as it turns out, you know, he may have been 18, 19, 20, 20 you know, it's now 21 ostensibly, um, all of his followers in the group itself were definitely all teenagers. So people who were younger looking up to a guy who was an older teenager um, when all of this started. And so that when he started like writing out, I know I have, you know, government security clearance. I work on a military base. I have all this information that people need to know. And he would be writing out all the stuff that he learned that day. Apparently he was not getting enough traction from basically like the teens in his group. And so he graduated from actually typing out highly restricted classified information to printing those, um, you know, maps, documents, whatever, um, bringing them home, taking pictures of them and posting those online. And in the Washington Post article, one of the people in that group that the writers interviewed said, like, it's crazy because if you thought it, it just like there was stuff there. And, you know, obviously these like teenagers didn't understand like the gist of it, but that there were people from Ukraine and Russia who were really drawn to basically information about the war. And that there are people from all across the world in this group who really look to each other for sort of just online fellowship, whatever human interaction they were not getting, like IRL, which is an acronym for in real life, they were getting it through this group. And so the pictures that's what became really um, exciting to them. And one of them posted it to another Discord channel. That made its way from Discord onto Russian Telegram. From Russian Telegram, it came into Twitter. Once it came into Twitter, it had thus gone, uh, thus gone wide uh, mainstream. Uh, Bellingcat, the organization that does a lot of open source research, was able to basically do all of this first and was able to figure out that uh, in fact, there were quite a number of people from Ukraine and Russia who were the ones who had been spreading from basically these English language discord uh, subgroups um, onto the larger uh, Russian language internet. So why do people do this? So I have a uh, you know, friend and colleague uh, named Gary Ross uh, who had you know, years of uh, experience in um, you know, federal law enforcement, counterintelligence, and um, you know, insider threat. And he has a great book that I will look up the name in just a second. Uh, I think it's called Who's Guarding, Who Watches the Watchmen? The Conflict Between National uh, Security and Freedom of the Press. And one of the things that, which was published by National Intelligence University, it's a, it's a great book. Um, and one of the things that I'd asked, uh, you know, the, my friend about this is, you know, what motivates people to leak national security uh, documents online or anywhere, I should say, even this existed before like the internet. And he said, there is a handy acronym that counterintelligence people use, which is MICE, money, ideology, coercion, and ego. And that one of those four core human motivations is what motivates people to do bad things. And in this this is essentially the dumbness and the lowness, the lowness of the stakes that ostensibly the guy who, you know, this Massachusetts Air National Guardsman who, you know, had this devoted, you know, group of, you know, like two dozen other teenagers was effectively looking for their admiration. He did, you know, apparently people in the group said that, you know, he wanted people to know what was going on in the war. So there's some element of, you know, some ideological backtracking on this. But fundamentally, 
was not motivated by money, ideologically did not have, you know, anything even close to like Edward Snowden, um, certainly was not coerced in any way, but just wanted imaginary internet points. And that's why this is happening. Talking about this before we recorded, I was sort of grinding my teeth and I'm like, I do not, ex you know, as a, as a military professional and someone who won, like, signs on the dotted line saying I won't do this and I will protect this information because I know that it, it's not just where big blue arrows on the map might go, you know, but there are human lives attached to all of these different things, right? Which is why you try and protect it. But you have, you, you look at, you know, people like Snowden or Manning or reality winner. They were, they were all heroes in their own mind, but, but I, I think it's fair to say that they thought that this was like something the world needed to know. Right. So we're will they were willing to violate their oaths, all the things that they'd signed about not doing this, um, you know, in the case of Snowden, giving up any chance, you know, basically flying himself to being, you know, under house arrest for the rest of his life in Russia. Uh, you know, Manning and reality winner had, uh, you know, they they took some consequences, but, uh, you know, but Manning got released. So and is now a minor social media star, you know, but they, you know, they thought they were doing something for the sort of the larger common good, like the world needs to know. Right. And if. And if that's your attitude, you're willing to suffer some personal consequences because because it's right. You know, it's just the world needs to know. As you said, this guy's looking for a couple dozen people for things like whose line is it anywhere? The points don't matter, right? The points, there's just nothing quantifiable. It's for maybe a few uh, thumbs up emojis in in the Discord chat is what he was looking for. Yeah, I know. Well, maybe we'll we may have to come back on this, you know, depending on what, uh, you know, more revelations about what the information is, as well as the possible, you know, very real operational world impact of, um, you know, somebody gives a, you know, put your plans on the Internet. Well, you can't do that plan now. Right. You got to come up with another plan. But maybe you, you've done a lot of work to get that plan ready. So, you know, going back to the impact of the, you know, alliances and partners, you know, we saw this previously with Snowden, Manning and Winner, like people are not going to share secrets if they don't think you can keep them. You know, there's important information that allies share with each other to go after, you know, pursue common interests or deal with common threats. But uh, if you can't be trusted to hold those things, nobody's going to tell you those secrets. And then that has possible operational impacts, right? Like, again, we were talking about before, which way is the pendulum going to swing? You know, we looked at the lead up to 9-11 where information was stovepiped and compartmentalized. Nobody was within, you know, U.S. government. Nobody was sharing anything. Well, that's how... All those, you know, the red lights were missed because not everybody saw all the red lights, um, didn't see the the pattern. You need you need lots of information to find that pattern. And they didn't have it. Right. Well, you know, then we you know, we open things up and we do interagency stuff and we give more people security clearances. And this is what happens. So I, you know, I remember back when uh, I, I don't have a strong memory of sort of fallout from Snowden, but I do remember, uh, you know, when all the stuff from Manning came out, one of the immediate impacts was shutting down use of USB drives and, C and you know, CD, DVD burners make information easily portable, because I believe that's how Manning got information out of the SCIF, uh, the Special Compartmentalized Information Facility Manning was working in, right? Put it on a, on a USB drive or on a on burn it onto a CD. And then you just put it in your pocket and walk out with it, you know, so they shut that down on us. Right. So that we can, we can't use those because that was a spillage. Well, this guy just printed stuff out and shoved it in his pocket. Do we not get to print stuff anymore? I don't know, you know, but there's going to be a, there's going to be a response and it's going to be trying to, you know, close the barn door after the horses have left, but it's also going to make that it's going to make the jobs harder of that 99.9999999% of people who are trying to get after the mission and who need to share information to do their job and who need to keep secrets to do their job. It's good. Just, it's going to make it harder for everybody else and all for a couple of points on the internet. I can imagine that every government printer, you know, you're now like, I don't know what, what the situation is like in, you know, every printer around the world, but you may have to sign off or get permission to, to print things and, you know, have someone, you know, like see what the file name is and, you know, basically like, you need to track your printing from now on seems to be exactly the sort of um, onerous and low tech thing that can be done in order to try to prevent this. And that toggling between you, sh you don't share enough, you share too much. Uh, can we make something that makes uh, it just more of a hassle for everyone? Again, yeah, and it we still take our shoes off at the airport. That's like the long term effect of things like this.
unless there's some revelation that comes out that the, like this guy is a you know a, a triple agent playing it deeply to do this there's no brilliance here impact for the absolute the lowest lowest possible stakes like i was i was joking before like that you know be like can it get any lower like you tr you trade give the front key to the nsa for a bag of chips but i but i thought about that i'm like at least you get a bag of chips right like a bag of chips is real it can do something for me right it, you know it, yeah. it, it feeds a it feeds a basic human function of having sustenance for your body to do stuff this guy got nothing nothing but a couple of thumbs up on a in a room that only a couple other dozen people were in There's, so this isn't like if he wanted to make his name known to the world and have a have a global impact because of some ideological thing it, it, it's not a play at all it's a game where the points don't matter or there, there's going to be a lot more you know grinding of teeth over this i'm i'm sure in the coming weeks but uh i i can't imagine a larger delta between the impact and why the person did it uh than what we're seeing right now yep so we'll we'll, we'll see where it goes from here bellingcat again was the first person to uh identify the individual like name uh, apparently they found him through his uh, steam profile and steam uh again yeah that's another that's another gaming we're getting deep into the internet here for those who don't play uh video games uh, Steam is probably, I would imagine, the biggest place uh, to buy computer games. It, it's a pretty major digital warehouse, essentially. It's where you, it, it, and again, I'm, I'm going to show my age here a little bit because I'm old enough to remember when Steam didn't exist and you had to go go to a store to buy a game on a CD or, I'm so old, I remember buying games on floppy disks, uh, but that's a different story. But yeah, but but Steam essentially, um, it it initially was a uh, sort of a platform that developers would use to help push, like, I think push out like updates and patches to their games in a more streamlined fashion. And then it started to get used as sort of a security mechanism where, um, you know, because if you buy a game in a store, it's uh, th at that point, the company has no way to sort of control you from like cracking through the security key on that game, possibly making a list of copies, distributing them. And, you know, they don't make any money off the game because you're giving away free copies. So you then you would have to, like, use Steam to sort of to enter your security key so that you can unlock access to the game you bought. And then, you know, given as our world has become more and more digital with less less physical things, and then it, it it just became the game, the game warehouse platform. That's where you went to went to go to buy games because you you didn't need discs anymore for our listeners who are, again, are, you know on the 40 plus side is maybe some terms that are not necessarily familiar, but you know, maybe the, the point to end on here is this is the world this, this is another domain, another battlefield where you can win and lose things. Maybe this becomes a catalyst to maybe, you know, pay more attention to, you know, both what your adversary can do on the platform, but also maybe ways you can gain advantages on different platforms. But like the point is like risk to national security, don't just come through national security devoted platforms. It's any 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 platform where a person connects to the larger digital world is a is a possible point of point of entry to have a national security impact. And it, it can be five thousand degrees removed, right? Like I can't think of anything more removed from deep national security secrets than like a random like Minecraft Discord server with a couple dozen people. But the point is that there there's no removal anymore. It is flat. Th those layers are basically on top of each other from national security concerns, effective operations to random dude looking for, you know, some Fortnite coins, basically. God, and I think about it, like, even if you'd gotten Fortnite, like uh, Fortnite currency, right? At least you can buy, you can buy new, like, modifications. You can, you can change your avatar. I don't think he'd be, this guy even got that much. Really just got a couple thumbs up. I mean, I personally, like, we, we, I mean, I have a general sense of, like, who listens to this, who watches this. Again, and this is sort of like, to give this sense for people who are not like terminally online, uh, perhaps like uh, you and I are, is like, so I'm 41 years old. And so I've been online, like in a serious fashion at this point, maybe like, I would say maybe 30 years, certainly 25 to 30 years. And the internet of like the, like the early mid 1990s was essentially something like, things called bulletin board systems. And this is even before the introduction of AOL. So that you would have basically really small online communities that were really niche oriented and that it was either geographic or some specific interest. So everyone who was in that group had something in common already. 
that's then to understand MySpace, Friendster, and then Facebook, and so many of these other social networks were meant to be one, very public, tied to your real name, and to basically be as not inclusive, but to be as broad as possible. With the discord in terms of creating community, and this really goes into your larger point about, you know, where people are, is that these discord, like discord, the app, discord, the channels, and then the actual, like the servers, like the rooms inside, those are meant to be pretty niche communities of people who know each other fairly well, or at least as well as they think they do, because nobody knows that you're a dog on the internet. That's a very old internet joke. Can't bother to explain it at this point. Um, but the point being is when we think about where security risks can come from and what are security risks that can be exploited is that people in these servers, these servers are small, people get to know versions of other people quite well. They may or may not present the real versions of themselves, but they create sort of these senses of basically community and belonging and commonality that they're not getting in real life. And those are the sort of people who are deeply exploitable and also deeply exploited. And that's essentially the thing to, to keep in mind. These exist. There are probably on, we could look it up. There's probably what millions of people on discord right now. There's perhaps tens of millions of people who use it on a weekly basis. These are giant communities, which have the feelings of being really small clubs. And that's essentially very different from the Facebook experience that people have. It's forms part of their lives, but really doesn't take over their lives unless they just get totally like, you know, they go down it, like, you know, the, yeah, the it, MLM it, marketing or QAnon on like, you know, rabbit holes. Yeah, it, it can take over your life, you know, yeah. we've seen, you know, seen it happen. Yeah, but I, th I think maybe the final couple of points we can we can walk away from this is, you know, one, they're both large and very small intimate communities. But the point is, it's like it's not limited to uh, to a community in a physical place that that's a that's an intimate community that can still have a very large impact. And then kind of the last one, I'm going to I'm going to give another shout out to, you know, to Ma uh, Matthew Ford and Andrew Hoskins. But they had mentioned when when I last talked to them, yeah, you, sort of your point about like the there's a certain you know, demographic or age range to, to which these things may be, you know, quite alien, right? Didn't exist when they were born and growing up. But uh, but to, to Matthew and Andrew's point was like, you may not care about the internet, but the internet cares about you and can still have an impact even if you are, if you're totally off the grid. Because like the, the political, the military coordination, you know, potentially, the e you know, economic impacts, I don't want to overstate, but I don't want to understate either. Like this will, this will have an effect. And even if you are, if you, if you've kept some distance from, you know, the digital world and, uh, and you're, you're trying to sort of be off the grid as much as you can, uh, it can still come back and, and do things to you and have an impact on your life. So, uh, I, I sort of don't have a, I'm not trying to draw a larger moral, but it's, um, I think it's something that in, in, in maybe both like more senior military or political leaders, like, and, and, and I'm thinking about, you know, sort of watching some of the oversight hearings in Congress about TikTok. Like I am confident a lot of the, uh, you know, the representatives in, in those oversight hearings, not necessarily, um, you know, TikTok users themselves, especially if they've been reelected to Congress, you know, 10 or 12 times, right? Um, but you still need to pay attention and you still need to have an understanding that these things can have, it, they may sound like, you know, they may have a cute name like TikTok or, discord or minecraft you may look at it as as a, as a game or as a hobby no it is a domain it is a battlefield it is something you need to understand and you need to be ready to to operate on it effectively and i think uh you know maybe this is another indication that we still have a long way to go until uh you know we at least on the you know the u.s side where some of us can operate there fairly well but there's still a long way to go in terms of, in terms of understanding the implications of what that domain, what that battlefield can do to your adversary, but also to you. I think so that's on that, point on that we happy can, note, <laughs> we can, we can pause on, uh, on, on gamer leaks. And, uh, basically like, you know, when we take this up next week, uh, I'm sure this guy will be 
uh, under arrest if he's not under arrest by the end of today. And uh, really looking forward to reading that indictment. Well, you've all, um, we, we cover a lot of ground here. Um, good. Uh, it's always good to catch up with you and make sure that our listeners uh, and our viewers are caught up as well. Yeah, I, I guess we need to do, do better about you know, waiting a couple of weeks between each one of these because it seems like the ones where we have a little bit more than a week, man, a lot of stuff happens. Yeah. It's a, it's a busy world. Um, so, all right, but we'll try and make the next one a little bit sooner than we did for this one. Sounds good. All right. Take care. And uh, to audience, as always, thank you for joining us. And we will have another one of these to you hopefully soon. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Crewland community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support and we'll see you on the next episode.